Remember when Slappy fell in love with a seven-year-old girl? Or remember when this old woman trafficked her own underage nephews to her friends because they wanted to marry them? Remember this? Goosebumps is kind of an insane show. Probably a lot more weird or crazy than you remember. I've been a diehard fan of this series ever since I was a little kid because I only watch the good episodes. There are quite a few episodes of this series that I just intentionally avoid watching because they are so just bad or uncomfortable or even just straight up just weird. So I forced myself to watch them so you don't have to. Now a couple of the episodes I, I am going to talk about I actually do really like, uh, particularly the first one, but a few of these are just so genuinely uncomfortable or insufferable. Really a lot of these episodes were hit or miss. And there are so many episodes I could talk about because this series is just full of weird shit. But I've narrowed it down to five I wanted to talk about and I'm saving the worst one for last. It is it is really bad. So stick around to hear about that one. But we're gonna start a little more on the tame side of things. And we're gonna talk about one of my favorite episodes of the entire series called Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns. So it's Halloween night and Drew and her best friend Walker are excited to trick or treat. But Walker tells Drew that his parents might not let him go out. So then for some reason, Drew blames Walker for that. I can't believe you're doing this. Okay. Also, despite the uh, series taking place in the U.S., the entirety of the show was filmed in Canada. So some of these kids speak with just, like, obscenely Canadian accents, and it is really funny sometimes. Anyway, Walker is nervous about going out because four people in the area just went missing, and Drew just does not care. Then, out of nowhere, these two kids show up because they were just hiding in the trees for some reason. But it's Shane and Shauna, who were apparently Drew's best friends before they moved away. Hey, I'm Walker. I know, she just said that. <laughs> Walker's great. <laughs> poor, poor Walker, bro. So then another couple of kids jump out from the bushes because they were also hiding in the bushes for some reason. But these ones are wearing costumes. And it's Tabitha and Lee, a couple of bullies who love to harass Drew. And this kid is so aggressively Italian, bro. So then Shane and Shauna tell Drew to invite them trick-or-treating and they have a plan to get back at them. Would you like to get back at them? Do dogs have fleas? My dog doesn't. <laughs> I fucking love Walker, bro. So they agree on a place to meet and start trick-or-treating. And this next scene is fucking insane. An old woman answers the door and immediately ushers them inside the house, and they all just kind of go inside without much of a second thought. Despite their stupidity, this scene was one of the only Goosebumps moments in the entire series to actually make me feel kind of uneasy. I'll just uh, let the rest of the scene speak for itself. Look at Walker's face, dude. <laughs> It was just a dream. Drew Drew was dreaming because that's a, a Goosebumps trope you'll see in so many episodes. But now it's time to actually start trick-or-treating. So Walker comes over and this is his costume. What are you supposed to be? Beatles 1962? What? No, I'm a dark and stormy night. Well, I see the dark, but where's the stormy? <laughs> fucking love this kid, dude. So then they meet up with Tabitha and Lee. Well, if it isn't Mighty Mouse. She's super Drew. Damn, bro. But they're a bit apprehensive because Shane and Shauna aren't there. How are they gonna get back at the bullies now? So whatever, they just start trick-or-treating and these pumpkin heads pop out of the bushes with the most over-the-top soundtrack you've ever heard. Ah! 
I unironically love their appearance. The way they speak is also really cool. One just kind of says something and the other just kind of repeats it. We know a new neighborhood. A new neighborhood. A better place. A better place. <laughs> Tabitha and Lee think that these pumpkin heads are Shane and Shauna, but Drew doesn't, which is logical to me because Shane and Shauna weren't almost seven feet tall the last we saw them. foreshadowing. So then they lead them through the woods, uh, shouting about a better place, but then they actually do take them to a better place. Sure hope there isn't a catch to that. The residents give them shit a shitload- oh my god. The residents give them shitloads of candy and then become victims of bad special effects. And it's getting late so they decide to head back for the night. But the pumpkin heads tell them that they can't leave. So Tabitha tries to put a stop to their shenanigans, but surprise, they're real. The headless pumpkin gets pissed off and shoots a laser from his claw to assert dominance. So then they force the kids to keep trick-or-treating. And this guy struggles to put his head back on. And after round two of trick-or-treating, they claim to be too tired to keep going. Which is understandable. So then they do this. Now it's empty. Go. More. And after that truly horrific crime against humanity, Tabitha comes to the conclusion that they must be the reason behind those four people who disappeared. So then they try to run and they're chased through the woods and these shots are admittedly pretty cool. And when they think they lost them, they pop out from nowhere and start spitting flames again. Which did I even mention they spat flames beforehand? I don't even know if I did, but they do. Tabitha and Lee get the fuck out and then this happens. Okay, so it turns out it actually was Shane and Shauna, and Walker has all the right questions. How? I mean, the way you just changed, and the way that beam shot out of your, your claw. Okay, you guys, how'd you do that? <laughs> well, there are advantages to being an alien. An alien? Yeah. Before they moved away, Shane and Shauna used to be my best friends. <laughs> they live next door to me. Uh, yeah, of course I knew they were aliens. We were neighbors. <laughs> so they start their trek back home. We better get back. Nice meeting you, Walker. You too. I love how obvious it is that these are hand puppets. Like, imagine the actors underneath just walking with their arm up the entire time, because you got the two fingers controlling the eyes and then the one with the mouth. <laughs> That's, or the three with the mouth. You, you got five fingers on a hand. So then, after walking a couple steps, they arrive at this massive-ass spaceship in the woods that somehow no one has noticed. And for the last plot twist, it turns out they actually were responsible for the missing people. And for some reason, they threaten Drew before they leave. Four missing people. Oh, by the way, we're pretty full, but I wouldn't eat all that candy. It might fat you up, and we will be back next year. Two feet again. Happy Halloween. <laughs> Thought you guys were best friends, but okay. A little more on the tame side of things, but still a trip for sure. Uh, we've got plenty more to talk about though, and it only gets weirder. The blob that ate everyone opens up with Zack and Alex, who are cleaning up Zack's basement. Alex is the adventurous type, so she walks a couple of feet and finds a huge ass wooden crate on a table set up in the middle of the room. Zack tells her not to open it. Because according to the fourth grader who wrote on the top of the box, it's a super secret science project. Turns out it's just a box full of worms, and there's nothing unusual about that, I guess. And then this big ass tentacle shoots up out of nowhere, gets a hold of Zack, and he's writhing on the floor for about 30 seconds while Alex does absolutely nothing. Well, what do you guys think? That was the scariest story that you've ever written. 
Yeah, I call it Adventure of the Blob Monster. It's awesome. If you ask me, it was lame. Ooh. I'm out of here. I agree with Adam. The title is kind of dumb, and the story's pretty lame. Also, do you notice something odd about Adam? If you didn't, that's fine. I'm gonna bring it up next time he's on screen, because it's pretty fucking funny. On the way home, Zack and Alex discover an old building that was destroyed by lightning, and they just go inside, because kids are dumb like that. And inside the building, Zack discovers an old typewriter, and then this happens. So because the printer tried to... The printer? Why did I write printer? Because the typewriter tried to kill him, he decides that it's perfect for writing scary stories. And without hesitation, he just tries to steal it. But out of nowhere, a stereotype appears. And she can't wait to get rid of that typewriter. So she just lets him have it. Fuck consequences, I guess. At home, Zack throws out this self-aware jab while contemplating taglines. Nah. As Zack types on the typewriter, the things he types start to reflect in real life. Clouds massed in the sky overhead and unleash their fury. Hey, where's that come from? Yeah, where's that come from? Also, I'd like to comment on how authentic Alex and Zack's relationship feels. It's one of the few times that a Goosebumps duo, like two kids, actually feel like they have some sort of chemistry, and it's really wholesome. I like the way I like the way they talk to each other. Anyway, she forces him to keep writing his story, and Alex is convinced that the things Zack is typing are coming true. So they do a little test. That's true. Or are you chicken? Chicken? I'll prove how dumb you are anytime. They heard a knock at the door. Lo and behold, shit keeps coming true. And when they go to answer the door, no one's there. So Alex forces Zack to type that someone is actually at the door, and that someone is Adam. What are you doing here? Whoa! Did we disturb you? No, I was just putting this back in my sister's room. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Okay, so now that Adam's back, have you noticed what's so funny about him? Almost all of his lines are dubbed over. Why? It's so fucking funny to me. Did you stand on the front porch before you knocked? I guess I was trying to remember why I came over. He sounds like Xavier Renegade Angel. Will you slumber a cucumber? So then Alex insults Adam as they try to prove the typewriter's powers. That's weird. No way I'm falling for a dumb old story like that. I don't know why we have to prove something to a kid in cowboy pajamas. <laughs> Alex is my favorite character in this episode. She's cool as hell. And then Adam writes on the typewriter and he does this goofy ass giggle. Gotta go. See ya. <laughs> the blob monster hid in Zack's basement waiting for fresh meat. What a jerk. So now there's a chance that Adam may have wrote the blob monster into existence in Zack's basement, and they go to check it out. Ooh, are you scared yet? You're teasing him for being scared? You were convinced like 12 seconds ago that the typewriter was making everything come true, and now you're just bullying him for being scared that there might be a big-ass blob monster in the basement. Okay. They discover that there is no blob monster in the basement, though, and that everything must have been a funny little coinkadink. But then Zack writes this. Hello? Alex, you've got to hear this. I'm writing my best story ever. Really? Yeah, it's great. The blob monster attacks the video store in the mall. Everyone's screaming, trying to run away. But they can't, and the blob eats everyone. Is that Alex? Uh-huh. Hang on a sec. Ask her to come for dinner. Okay. And why don't you run out and rent a video for tonight? So now, Zack's at the video store, and he runs into Adam and his goons. And this kid is a living cartoon character. Fresh meat! Fresh meat! Fresh meat! <laughs> you have me in your power, jerk. Hey, think you're ready for Revenge of the Gator people? <laughs> Kitty section's over there. Right, I must be in the jerk section. <laughs> Come on. 
Later. I have a new favorite character in this episode. <laughs> and then everyone in the store just suddenly goes apeshit. And because Zack is 12 and stupid, he decides to walk toward the danger instead of away from it. And then... I love how in the middle of being attacked by the blob, he's just going, yeah, I made you, I, I created you. Like it's gonna fucking listen. And this thing looks so cool. Like the practical effects in this show could be really great when they wanted to be. So then Adam comes back and he thinks the blob is some sort of balloon. What is it? Some kind of balloon? So he willingly walks up to it, even touches it at one point. And now watch this shit. It's true! I gotta get to the typewriter! At one point you can even see Adam himself push his body further into the blob's mouth. I can't make this shit up. So Zack runs home and finds Alex just kind of squatting around in his room. And then they try to write it out of existence, but oh no! The keys are jammed because, you know, it's a Goosebumps episode. Um, and then the blob bursts through the door and eats the fucking typewriter. But then Zack makes this brilliant revelation. Wait a minute. When Adam typed on it, nothing happened. What are you talking about? He typed that the blob was in the basement. When we went down there, it wasn't there. Well, it's here now. <gasps> Don't you get it? It's not the typewriter, it's me. And this is how the episode ends. Forget it. You, you wouldn't, wouldn't understand. understand. <laughs> yeah, so that and Attack of the Jack-O-Lanterns are unironically a couple of my favorite episodes from the series, and they're definitely a lot more fun to watch than the next three we're going to be talking about, um, because these next three is where it genuinely starts to get kind of weird and uh, not so much fun to watch. Bride of the Living Dummy was made in the wake of Bride of Chucky, so you know this one's just bound to be stupid. We open on this random guy in an alley looking for... stuff, and he comes across Slappy. He discovers the curse card, and just like everyone else, he reads it out loud for some reason. And this leads to Slappy's best intro yet. Hello, Jimmy. Look at those fucking eyebrows. <laughs> this Slappy design is the superior design. Fuck the books, bring back this version of him. I love it. So now Slappy is performing with this guy who we find out is a comedian named Jimmy O. James. And during his show, Slappy notices someone in the audience that he just can't take his eyes off of. As our heroes exit the theater, Katie, the little sister, realizes that her doll Mary Ellen is missing. So Harrison and her older sister split up to find the doll. I genuinely cannot remember her name right now. She is that, she is one of the most unlikable and forgettable Goosebumps protagonists in any episode. F, F tier Goosebumps main character by far. And so for some reason she decides to go look for the doll in this deep, dark, uninviting basement. In what fucking world would that be the first place you look? Likely you just left her in the seat that she was sitting in. Why would she just be in that basement? But okay. Anyway, she overhears Slappy and Jimmy talking to each other, and it's apparent that Slappy isn't quite normal. But then she accidentally barges in, and Jimmy has to cover his ass. <laughs> How'd you like it? Excuse me? A new act. You heard it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I figured the show needed some spark, so I, uh, I've been working on this routine where Slappy and I fight and argue, and I put a radio-controlled motor inside him. I think it's gonna be a big hit. I'm Jimmy O. James. And you are... Jillian. Jillian Zinman. Oh, okay, so her name is Jillian. So Jimmy takes the older sister's address in case they find the doll in the theater so they can send her back. What a nice guy. I hope he has nothing nefarious in mind. Back at home, we learn her dad is building birdhouses for the sake of breaking a world record. Then older sister gets a package in the mail that suspiciously looks like Slappy's case, and it even says Slappy on it. 
Turns out it is Slappy, and now Slappy lives with this family. And the older sister wants Slappy to stay in the basement, but Mary Ellen is telling Katie that she wants Slappy to stay upstairs. But Mary Ellen is just a dumb doll, and her opinion means nothing. So, whatever her name is, ignores Katie and keeps Slappy downstairs. Then we get this neat little POV shot with Slappy running around the house. And the next morning, the girls wake up to discover this. What? What is it? I want my bride. <laughs> so older sister is pissed off at Slappy and is going to take him back to Jimmy. But on the way out, her mom interrogated them about her missing wedding ring. But neither of the girls said they took it. I wonder who that could have been. Also, the dog is missing. So that's kind of just a thing, too. So here she is bringing Slappy back to Jimmy, and Jimmy comes out and says some stupid shit about how Slappy's evil, and despite this girl not even giving us an inkling of evidence that she suspected Slappy could have been alive, she's just like, damn, damn, that's, that's crazy how a doll could have done all this. Because everything around Jimmy's workshop is destroyed because Slappy apparently went on some sort of rampage. So she opens up the case to give Slappy back and, oh, it's the dog. And I'm not leaving until you take this dog. <laughs> what? So this means Slappy is still in the house. And back at the house, Katie and Harrison are watching Goosebumps episodes. That's pretty meta. Older sister calls the house and this stupid ass exchange happens. Finland residence. Katie. Listen to me. You have to get out of the house. Why? It's Slappy. He's still in the house. Only, he's not a dummy. Do you hear me, Katie? Slappy is evil. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but things will never hurt me. And I want my bride! <laughs> then Slappy locks Harrison in the bathroom and starts running around the house, causing chaos. Why the fuck does this bathroom just have a lock on the outside? And it's locked by this big ass skeleton key? What is the point of that? So now older sister is home and they try to escape with Harrison still locked in the bathroom and Slappy's little wooden ass is standing in their way. Just punt him across the room, he's like three feet tall. So they run to the basement for safety and try to escape through the window, but Katie says Mary Ellen won't let her. So out of frustration, what's her name takes Mary Ellen and Be careful! Don't make her angry! I've had just about enough of this dumb doll. Who are you calling dumb? Ugly. Ah! I told you! She's alive too! Surprise! She's alive too! And she's ten times creepier than Slappy wishes he could be. Turns out when Mary Ellen saw Slappy at his show, she fell in love with him. And then Slappy jump scares us at the window and breaks in. Now I'm already getting so tired of this episode. He reveals he stole the ring. You know, blah blah blah, we kinda already knew that. But then this happens. Oh, Slappy, you say the nicest things. And now I'm ready to be your bride. What? <laughs> you? Uh, I don't want you, you cheap uh, uh, plastic. I want her. You'll be mine, Kenny. You'll be my slave forever. <laughs> Yes, the thousand-something-year-old spirit that is possessing this ventriloquist dummy fell in love with a seven-year-old girl. And he wants to marry her and make her his slave. This is fucking weird. And naturally, Mary Ellen feels betrayed, and unsurprisingly, they get into a big fight. Here is that fight. So then they both fucking die. But don't worry, Slappy will come back, and when he does, he'll be up against Anakin Skywalker himself. Yes, you're seeing that right. That is Hayden Christensen in Night of the Living Dummy 3. And here he is, as a dummy. Also, uh, Ryan Gosling got his start in Goosebumps. Or was it Ryan Reynolds? It's one of the Ryans. 
So now that everything's over, the parents come home and all is good. But wait a minute. Harrison's still locked in the bathroom. So they go to check on him and... Sorry, folks. Harrison doesn't live here anymore. <laughs> That's Bride of the Living Dummy. It's the worst of the Living Dummy episodes. Let's move on. Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes is one of my least favorite episodes in the series, and this is where it just gets unintentionally funny as hell, and it's just ridiculous. We open on Joe and Mindy playing catch, but they lose the ball in their neighbor's yard. Their neighbor is this really strict military guy named Major McCall. This guy's a badass, he's as tough as nails, but he is passionate about gardening. Like, re really passionate about gardening. So now their dad comes home, and he shows up with these two ugly-ass lawn gnomes, which are weirdly huge. Like, have you ever seen a lawn gnome that big? And remember that there are only two of them. He brought two of them home. That number is important. Remember that the dad only brought home two lawn gnomes. That'll come back later. So now they're setting up the gnomes in their yard, and Major McCall thinks they look ugly as fuck. And he's absolutely right. Turns out him and the family are competing against each other in a contest for who has the best garden. And McCall is positive he will win. And I don't blame him. I love the cottagecore aesthetic, but this is just not how you do it. So then we get this POV shot like in the last episode, except it's worse. And in the morning, the Major comes over to confront the family about his smashed melons. And of course, he suspects it was Joe. I know they're trying to make the Major look like an asshole, but it's hard to see him being in the wrong here. Like, yeah, he is a little bit mean about shit, but he's justified if you ask me. I mean, you wouldn't suspect that the lawn gnomes came to life and did this shit, right? There's no way that could have been what happened. That'd be fucking stupid. Then Joe discovers the gnomes are covered in ink and melon seeds. Hmm... So Joe happens to wake up and notices that the gnomes are missing, so he goes outside to investigate, and what he finds will shock you. The gnomes sound like they're killing cats. But Joe just finds them destroying Major's garden. The gnomes discover they're being watched, and they try to very slowly chase Joe, probably to eat him or something? What, what exactly do gnomes do when they catch you? Do they just kill you? But the Major's security system kicks into high gear and he is distraught. Poor guy. All he wants to do is garden. So then the little people revert back into regular gnomes so they don't blow their cover. Joe? I didn't do it, Dad! Honest! It was the gnomes! Stop right there! No, really! It was the gnomes, Dad. You have to believe me. They turned into little people and destroyed the Major's garden. You have to believe me, Dad. So then Joe, unsurprisingly, is punished. And he's punished by having to fix McCall's garden all on his own. And Mindy, of course, doesn't believe Joe's story about the gnomes, because who would? So Joe sets his alarm to catch the gnomes in the act. But his dumbass forgets to put tape in the camera. Remember when cameras had tape? I don't. I was born in 2003, so I had digital cameras. So he tries to wake up his parents, but they might as well be dead. So he wakes up his sister instead. He drags her outside, and as they traverse their jungle of a yard, the gnomes find the kids, and this chase ensues. The three gnomes all... Wait a minute, three? Where did the third one come from? Weird. Anyway, the chase continues, and one of the gnomes manages to trip Joe. And then for some reason, they steal the video camera, and one of them does this goofy-ass dance? So then the four gnomes are discussing what they're gonna do with... Where did the fourth one come from? Yeah, so they're just appearing out of thin air at this point. Why did they reuse the shot of that one dancing? He looks so goofy. So then the gnomes just start fighting each other for some reason. And whilst they're brawling, the kids discover that the light freezes them. And so they use the flashlight as a weapon. So the kids lead them into Major McCall's yard, and the security system kicks into gear again. And those big-ass lights freeze the gnomes in place. 
despite getting caught by the Major, they just kind of run off and disappear. But that's okay, because the Major is way more concerned about these ugly-ass gnomes sitting in his yard. So as he goes to get rid of the first gnome, he takes it into a dark area without realizing that they're, you know, alive. I'd also, I love to imagine how they film this moment, because whoever's playing Major McCall is just straight up carrying a little person over his shoulder. It's the next day and the contest judges are judging this family's yard, and all is going great until they discover... something. And it really turns them off. The family has no clue what they're talking about, so they go to check it out, and what follows is the funniest ending to a Goosebumps episode. Jump scare warning, by the way. They turned him into a fucking lawn gnome. So that's what gnomes do? They don't kill you, they don't eat you, they just turn you into a lawn gnome? And then you join their little lawn gnome army or something? Okay. I'm down with that. I wouldn't mind getting caught by a lawn gnome. Finally, though, I can talk about uh, the last episode which is definitely the weirdest and it is the most uncomfortable episode in the entire series and it is really bad. This episode is called An Old Story and is one of the few episodes along with Bride of the Living Dummy that was actually not based on one of the original books. This is a completely original concept for the series. Quite frankly, most of these non-book episodes sucked except for Awesome Ants. That one was pretty cool. But anyway, we open with Tom and John looking for something to eat, and they can't find anything. In the basement, John walks into a spiderweb, and he hates that. And then they get locked in the basement, because this is a Goosebumps episode. And John is scared, so he's out of here. The acting in this episode is the worst you will see from a Goosebumps episode, and no hate to the kids, because they are trying, right? But it's just kind of a given with Goosebumps episodes. They're kind of not notorious for their campy acting, and it's really funny. Then Lady Dimitrescu opens the door, and take a shot every time you hear this string sound effect. Why did they have to play it so many times? Anyway, I was kidding. It's not Lady Dimitrescu. It's Aunt Dahlia. And she's taking care of them while their mom is on some sort of trip away from home. Aunt Dahlia takes it upon herself to whip up some treats for the boys. I man, I sure hope she's not planning anything nefarious. That would be... That'd kind of suck, honestly. That'd be a shame. Look at these... Oh my god. Look at these VR headsets, dude. They're still playing the game with a controller, and they're viewing it on the TV screen. What is the point of the VR headset? Aunt Dahlia gives the boys these weird-looking cookies, and she manipulates them into eating them. Prunes? They're good for you. Prunes? But the boys end up loving the cookies, so it's fine. John and Tom try going to bed that night, but they keep getting woken up by the sound of laughing. Tom knows it's Dahlia, but John is a pussy. And then Aunt Dahlia bursts through the door to make sure they were in bed. Because bursting through the door is the way you do it. That would just, if they were in bed, you would just wake them up by doing that. What was the point of that? It's the next morning, and Tom and John are... Fi That's their names, right? Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's the next morning, and John and Tom are feeling kind of funny. Their bodies are sore, and they feel really tired. But according to Dahlia, it's just the flu. No big deal. And then John walks into the room. Feeling. Seriously, why did they use that sound effect so much? It's like the Johnny Test whip crack sound effect. A modern day equivalent to that, like, this, it would be the vine boom sound effect. Just imagine that, the vine boom in place of those string sounds. I'm feeling. As you see, the prune cookies have started to transform them into old people. And the old people clothes are just a part of that transformation? They just, like, grew on their body or something? Because they just woke up and 
fucking a sweater and old people clothes? How the fuck does that work? Anyway, John and Tom realize something is wrong and that stupid sound effect keeps playing. <laughs> Aunt Dahlia invites some friends over and this is where the episode turns from hilariously bad to just straight up uncomfortable. Now, where are those two cute boys you've told us so much about? <laughs> the suspense is killing me. <laughs> When she calls them cute, you probably think she means it in like a puppy dog or a little kitten kind of way, right? I wish that was the case. So Tom and John are introduced to the old women and oh my god, it's creepy. What the fuck is this episode? Okay, so Dahlia sends Tom off to the store to go get some milk. Where have I heard that one before? While Tom is at the store, he catches a glimpse of himself in the mirror and realizes he's getting even older than he already was, and that stupid sound effect plays 17 times! Okay, I don't know how many times it actually was. I tried counting, but it was drowned out by, like, seven other sound effects I, I i i could not hear it tom has returned from the store and john is also older than he was before so tom and john managed to sneak away from the old women and they tried to call their mom for help but dahlia was on the other end of the phone so the they go upstairs to make sure the boys aren't trying to escape now the ladies are forcing them to play some old people board game yucky John says he has to go to the bathroom, but he actually sneaks into Dahlia's room, hoping to find any clues that might be able to get them out of this little situation that they're in. I'll let this next scene speak for itself. And little Jonathan is so adorable, and Lillian wants to marry Tom. We've got it all worked out. We're going to move to Miami and live next door to one another. The boys will never have to be apart. Nobody's getting married until you pay my fee. Then we'll talk. Oh, well, don't worry about that. They're so delicious. I'll write you a check right now. Yeah, so Dahlia is trafficking her own nephews to her friends. They're going to marry the boys and move to Miami. What is this concept? And what is Dahlia gonna tell her sister? You know, the kid's mom? Hi, Dahlia. How are my boys doing? Oh yeah, about that. John gets Tom to follow him into the kitchen and he tells him what's going on. And Tom just doesn't care about it anymore? Okay. He's super hungry, but solid food hurts to eat. So he searches the cabinets and finds a jar of baby food for some reason. And can you guess where this is going? The baby food uses its VFX to de-age Tom, so they scarf it down and return to normal. The old woman barge in and discover that they're young again. Mimi and the other old woman whose name I forgot start fighting John for the baby food, and John tells them to go long. He tries to catch the baby food, but he misses and it splatters all over the floor, so now they're fucked. So what does Tom do? Not the prune juice, no. He just kills her. What are they gonna tell their mom? So her friends escape and, uh, you know, all is well, right? It's resolved, right? Tom is now talking to his mom on the phone, but suddenly he hears cries of a baby coming from another room. John somehow got a hold of another entire jar of baby food and just ate it all. Where did he get that? So Tom digs through the trash and finds the remnants of one last prune cookie. He force feeds it to John and the ending is left ambiguous and we never know if John actually ages up again. Thank God this episode is over.
Now that was just five episodes, and there are weirder episodes. None, none of them are the, are weirder than an old story. That is the weirdest it gets. But as far as the blob that ate everyone, attack of the jack o' lanterns, there are definitely weirder episodes I could have put in here. But I put it, those two in there particular because I like them and they're weird enough to make the list. But the latter three, or the last three, Bride of the Living Dummy, Revenge of the Lawn Gnomes, and what is an old story? Those three are just stupid and weird and uncomfortable, and the last one especially is probably just an episode that should have never been made. But there are plenty more episodes that I could talk about. I could probably do this video like two or three more times with different episodes, and you would be shocked to hear what some of these episodes entail. I almost, there was this one episode I almost threw on this list called Click about um, this kid who's babysitting this supernatural baby that's just like, I don't, doing weird shit? And the baby's like evil? It's weird. And then there's Attack of the Mutant, which is just a visual nightmare and is just so, it is such an ugly episode. But I hope you enjoyed this video. I uh, haven't really thought of a way to end this. But, uh,. Yeah, thank you for watching. If you want to see more videos like this, I'll definitely be glad to do them because I enjoy making videos like this. Yeah, thank you for watching. Tell me what you thought about the video and uh